Military analyst, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North. Uh, Colonel, good to see you today. Uh, good to be with you, Shannon. I got to ask you, uh, as we watch this play out, are there any good guys in Syria for us to back that we can do so with 100% certainty? Not with 100% certainty, primarily because we have such abysmal human intelligence. We don't know who the real freedom fighters are in Syria. Our NSA has spent so much time spying on us, they don't even know the phone numbers of the right people to call over there. And so lacking that kind of knowledge, you have to ask yourself, what will these cruise missiles do? Bill Clinton provided an answer to that back in June of 93, more than two months after Saddam Hussein tried to assassinate George H.W. Bush, Clinton fired 23 cruise missiles at Baghdad. Saddam spent another decade in power abusing his own people and, of course, killing those his opponents he could. Cruise missiles don't prevent terror attacks because two weeks after our embassies were attacked in Kenya and in Tanzania in August of 1998, Clinton fired 75 cruise missiles at a tent camp in Afghanistan and a pharmaceutical plant in Sudan. That didn't stop al-Qaeda from killing 17 sailors and wounding 29, 39, excuse me, on the USS Cole on the 12th of October 2010. 2000. You know, cruise missiles make weak presidents feel strong, but they don't have a long-term effect on despots or terrorists. That makes you wonder, what would we be doing by launching this attack? And if we did do something that wasn't aimed at, at regime change and taking out chemical weapons, you know, if, if you do the strikes uh, for reasons other than those ultimate goals, um, what does Assad do? Will he respond in kind in some way by taking it out on his own people? Um, will things escalate? Well, look, he has not responded to the Israelis. Uh, twice now have gone in across the border near Damascus to take out missiles that were headed to Hezbollah from the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iran. And he didn't take, out, take any action against the Israelis for taking out his nuclear reactor back uh, several years ago. The, the bottom line is that what Obama needs to do before he gives the order to launch the Tomahawks is he really ought to do some things that might really make a difference. First, 9-11 is a jihadi anniversary. It's less than three weeks away. What he ought to immediately do is beef up security at every American diplomatic post in the Middle East and in sub-Saharan Africa. Second, he had better tell the Israelis in advance of any military action he's going to take because they are our only real ally in that part of the world and it's a part of the planet where we desperately need friends. Third, he ought to go to the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence with a presidential finding ordering our very risk-averse intelligence agencies to immediately hire sufficient numbers of contractors, yes, those hated contractors, who then can go out and train, equip, and send into the field a real Syrian freedom fighter. And he ought to start by recruiting them at the refugee camps in Jordan, not in Turkey or Iraq. And finally, he ought to read Barbara Tuckman's excellent book, The Guns of August, about how great powers stumble into conflagration. It happened in 1914, in the month of August. You mentioned Congress, and that's a topic that keeps coming up now that we have members weighing in on both sides for or against some kind of further action or attack or strike involving Syria. How critical is it that the president get them on board? You know, we have some members, including the speaker's office, saying, uh, you know, House Speaker John Boehner, that the president hasn't directly made a call to him. He's heard from White House staff. It, yeah. it, it doesn't sound like uh, a, a big move towards building a coalition on the Hill. No, it's not. And, you know, I, again, I'm the, I'm the old guy, so I'm the historian. I can remember the night before we went into Grenada that the President of the United States brought the leaders of Congress to the residence of the White House, not to the Situation Room, and briefed Tip O'Neill and all the rest of them in that as to exactly what was going to happen, and it was already underway by, by dawn. Incidentally, Tip O'Neill then leaked it to the Washington Post, but by then it was too late. He needs to do the same thing in this White House if he wants to buy a buy-in from Congress. We're going to have to fund whatever additional measures come out of this whole thing. And this president's not been particularly good about keeping Congress informed of anything. Yeah, and it's not just Republicans who say that. Democrats report the same thing, right. that there's not really a relationship there. Um, the broader picture, obviously, this isn't just about Syria. Uh, what's the impact of the president's decision on relations with Russia, with Iran, uh, who is clearly involved here as well? 
Well, clearly he's not going to go to the United Nations for permission or affirmation on this thing because he knows that both the Russians and the Chinese have a veto in the Security Council. So what he's counting on is NATO and, of course, the Arab League. Well, the problem with NATO is in Turkey you have a NATO ally, at least on paper, but the Erdogan government has been backing the radicals, not the so-called real freedom fighters in the Free Syrian Army. And they're doing that because the Muslim Brotherhood is essentially distributing the arms and ammunition and the even humanitarian supplies to the Syrian opposition. So Erdogan is not acting on our behalf. The outcome of all of this is very much uncertain, and it does make you wonder how effective, no matter how many missiles he fires, if it's going to turn out the same way as Clinton's effort. Since this unrest sparked in that region, uh, in Tunisia initially, and has spread, uh, there's been a lot of talk of replacing negatively viewed uh, leaders and coalitions with positive ones. Is, are, is this region, are these individual countries ready for that, for democratically held elections, uh, going to the ballot box, and, and backing someone who will include everyone? Great, great, great question, Shannon, because the, the effect of the so-called Arab Spring speech that he gave in Cairo in 2009 has not made life better for anyone in the Arab world. It's created a lot of anticipation that they could somehow pull off an election. Well, this administration is wedded to the idea that a single democratic election is all you need. Well, the proof of that is in Tunisia, in Libya, in Cairo, and what you're now seeing spreading throughout that part of the world. No one's better off for it. The bottom line of it is, is as we found out in the Reagan administration, sometimes you better live with the devil you know than the devil you don't know, because what you end up with is something like Iran. A single election does not a democracy make, and we ought to realize that. Colonel North, we thank you, and we appreciate the history lesson and context as thank well. You. Good to see you.